Okay, so I want to provide a brief overview of what a theory is in general and what are specific international relations theories. So let's start by just talking about what a theory is and, and what theories do. So think of whatever um, particular theory that you're familiar with. Let's go with the Big Bang Theory, um, which as a side note, is one of my favorite shows, but the Big Bang, okay, so what does this theory do? It's supposed to describe how the universe began. It explains all the different scientific um, ideas about how molecules and atoms and all the different elements came together to create the universe, and supposedly try to predict what's going to happen in the future. We want all theories to do that. We want things described for us, explained to us, and most importantly, we want theories to predict future behavior. So if we think about political science, we want theories that explain, describe, and predict how states are going to behave in the international system. Okay. So I've written down a definition for you of a theory, which is a set of propositions and concepts which explains phenomenon by, speci uh, by specifying relationships among the concepts. All right, so we want a grand theory of international relations to explain why states engage in cooperative behavior. We want a theory to explain why the states go to war with each other. We want theories to explain how and why international institutions impact states' behavior. And all this can lead to hypotheses about why states do the things they do. What are the conditions that lead states to go to war? So why does war occur? We have a theory um, that might help us explain that that's going to lead to some hypotheses where we posit the relationship between several concepts. So in the field of human rights, we might want to explain why is it that some states are more likely to violate the rights of their citizens than others. So we might think, well, democracy might matter. So democracy is a concept that we're going to test to see whether or not it influences a state's likelihood of violating its citizens. And we can develop a theory about that, a theory that in democracy, citizens have more say in their government. Um, we could develop the theory further to say that in democracies, there are... Um, institutional constraints that lead um, that prevent leaders from engaging in uh, repressive behavior. So that's going to lead us to a hypothesis that suggests that the more democratic a state is, the less likely they are to engage in human rights violations. So with our theories and our hypothesis, we want to test these things in order to try to verify whether our theory is viable or not. We never say that a theory is proven in international relations or political science in general or the social sciences really because if you prove a theory then you have a law and we don't have laws in political science because we're dealing with the human condition. Okay let's talk about before we dive into the theory something called the levels of analysis and this is used in international relations in order for us to be able to study the different phenomenon that we're interested in. So these levels of analysis, um, we can point to three major levels. Some particular books look at four or five, but we can break the study of international relations into three basic levels. At the individual level, which is in the center of the circle, what we're doing is taking a micro-level approach to IR. In what ways, in the terms of someone's education, socialization, personality traits, and physical health, does a particular opponent of a major role in making foreign policy differ from other individuals who have held positions of authority, for example? So one favorite question um, by many revisionists is, what if Hitler hadn't been the leader of Germany? Would, that, would, would things have... Um, unfolded differently in terms of the Holocaust, in terms of World War II. And so explanations at this level must relate differences in the characteristics of decision makers to differences in the decisions they make. So you're really looking at individual behavior to see everything else held constant. Do these differences in personality, perceptions, activities, choices really make a difference in the decisions they make? And you might have guessed it's going to be very difficult 
to try and determine and measure individual levels of analysis. All right, the nation state, this level of analysis allows us to use a decision-making decision approach and to investigate in far more detail the condition and processes within states that affect foreign policy choices. So here we're looking at state characteristics. What kind of government do they have? Are they a, a democracy or are they authoritarian? What kind of economy do they have? Are they well-developed economically? What's the per capita GDP? We can look at the national interest of the states. Are they particularly engaged in trade? Are they particularly interested in developing nuclear weapons? Um, and then we can look at some of the interest groups at the state level. Then we have the international system level, and this is the most comprehensive level of analysis, really permitting us to study international relations as a whole. And that is to look at the overall global patterns of behavior among states, between states, and the level of interdependence among them. And so we're going to look at this level, focusing in on the overall distribution of capabilities, resources, and status in world politics. And so you can look at some of the things that we look at at the system level, like alliances, like international rules and norms. That all falls under this category of inter um, international law and organizations. We have these different organizations on the bottom part of the circle that make a difference. And the different theories that I'm going to introduce to you will have different things to say about these different levels of analysis. Okay, so there's really two major theories of IR. Realism, which is the oldest theory of international relations, it began, um, or the influences of realism can be traced back to Thucydides, um, who he's often referred to as the father of international relations. And then liberalism is the classic counterpart to uh, realism. All right, so the second lecture in this series is going to focus in on realism and liberalism.